Welcome to Park Street University. I'm Emily Pennington. I'm the content manager for Park Street and I head up the educational programming for Global Bar Week. We have several videos this week focusing on how COVID-19 has changed and reorganized the way that the alcohol industry works. And we're gonna continue on with that theme today, focusing on the mergers and acquisitions. We're gonna talk about how they're looking different this year, as well as um, make a few predictions on what they could look like in the future. Today, I have two excellent panelists with me. The first is Evan Civitas, operating partner of Distilled Ventures North America. He has 20 years of leadership experience in the wine and spirits space, including a stint as the president of Domain Select Wine and Spirits and 13 years at Deutsch Family Wine and Spirits. He joined DV in 2019, where he focuses on planning and operations for all the brands in the company's portfolio. Next, we have Ryan Lake, a principal at Arlington Capital Advisors. Arlington is a boutique investment banking firm that works in beverage, restaurant, and the cannabis space. The team at Arlington has successfully completed over $7 billion worth of transactions for beverage clients around the world. Ryan himself has over 20 years of investment banking experience and 15 within the beverage space specifically. He has sourced, structured, and negotiated transactions for beverage brands, suppliers, importers, and distributors. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Ryan to provide the 10,000 foot view of what's been happening in the m and space this year. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Really appreciate the invite and the chance to talk about this crazy landscape we all currently live in. Um, uh, as you said, Arlington is a, uh, we're a sort of a super specialized investment banking firm. We only focus on three verticals and beverage is a big chunk of what we do um, in the space I've worked in for the past 16, 17 years, uh, sort of fell into it by accident and grew to love the industry and the people and have uh, found a way to stick with it ever since. As you said, we've done, uh, our, our, the team at Arlington has done over $7 billion of, of alcoholic beverage deals um, across all of our careers. Um, and that's covered beer, wine, spirits, non-alc, and we've both done both distribution and uh, supplier side deals. So we've got a very sort of interesting breadth and depth of experience um, across our team and across also, um, we've had some people that have operated beverage companies um, and as well. So we've got a very unique sort of uh, depth of experience in our team and a, a broad spectrum of, of transactions we've done and, and ways we've helped companies, whether it be operating, consulting, or advising. Um, today, I wanted to talk, I mean, we're going to cover more of the specific M&A market recently, I think, in the Q&A time. Um, but at Arlington, we try not to look at the world um, in too much of a siloed point of view, I would say. Um, we try to take a step back when we can to look at the broader consumer landscape and what consumers are doing, um, because obviously consumers are interacting with different segments of food, beverage, other products, and the trends in one segment often have an impact on others. Um, so we try not to be too myopic in how we look at the space. I know today's topic is mostly around spirits, but we also want to talk about other beverage categories and the interplay there, because all of those consumer trends have an impact on what's happening with spirits as well as other beverage alcohol and non-alcoholic categories. And two of the biggest trends we're seeing today, uh, I would say in the M&A innovation and partnership market, um, pre and post COVID are sort of themes of convergence and resilience. Um, convergence is the one I want to talk about first. Um, it covers a lot of interesting dynamics. Um, we're seeing a lot of lines blurring, whether it's between beverage alcoholic categories, uh, geographies of products and where they come from and where they're sold and how products get to market. Uh, the first talk segment we wanted to talk about was sort of the convergence between non-alcoholic and alcoholic products. Uh, there's been a lot of interesting innovation in this. Um, I would say in the past few years and really in the past uh, two or three weeks alone, there's been a lot of developments that have been really fascinating to watch. Sort of the, the transformation um, of some of these companies that used to be very determined to stay sort of within their lane, whether it was beer or spirits or wine. Um, and now they're all getting more open to doing things that they wouldn't have done 10, 15 years ago because the consumer has moved across so many categories and they know they have to meet them there. Uh, so one of the big trends we're seeing is strategic companies either doing investments or partnerships or even acquisitions of, of categories that aren't usually in their wheelhouse. Um, a few examples on this slide, you know, Molson Coors and ABI have been very active recently in either investing in non-alcoholic brands or platforms and incubators or doing distribution and sort of marketing partnerships um, with certain brands. Um, and that's covered the, the gamut from 
from energy, uh, coffee, uh, workout and fitness products, all sorts of other innovative things through partnerships like Molson Coors has with LA Libations. Uh, a lot of interesting activity happening there. The big beer companies especially, I think, have been um, especially threatened by the growth of spirits in the past five or 10 years, and they've sort of realized they have to get more innovative. Um, you know, beer is still a very stable industry, but it's not growing the way spirits is. So they're trying to get more aggressive in, in terms of how they broaden their approach to the consumer. Um, another interesting deal, one of the more interesting ones recently is the Topo Chico upcoming hard seltzer. Um, of course, this is a brand that started non-alcoholic, was acquired by another non-alcoholic company, and then now is launching, or I guess say line extending, an alcoholic version into the US, but they're not going to produce or distribute or market it in the US. They're gonna go entirely through uh, a partnership with Molson Coors. Um, so that's a really fascinating convergence across categories and geographies uh, for a brand that has a lot of, of incredible momentum already. Um, and now they're gonna see whether that momentum can translate into the alcoholic beverage space. Um, other things we're seeing, um, spirits companies investing either in more traditional non-alcoholic products, um, such as Pernod Ricard, I think it was just last week, announced that their venture arm is investing in Liquid Death, which is it's a, a water brand with a, a lot of branding. Um, so that's an interesting investment for a spirits company. Of course, Diageo has invested in Seedlip, which is a non-alcoholic brand that, that tastes more like an alcoholic brand. So it, that sort of blurs the lines in multiple ways there. Um, and then sort of on the non-investment uh, side, we're seeing some interesting independent companies innovate things, um, such as what Boochcraft and Juneshine are doing in the kombucha space. I mean, you know, historically kombucha is either a low or no alcohol product. Um, and now you're seeing new entrants like these two players who are taking a low alcohol product and doing a high alcohol version um, and seeing a lot of early success. Another convergence we're seeing is, is blurring lines between different beverage alcohol categories. Um, obviously, Anheuser-Busch has been very active in the past few years in acquiring brands outside of beer, whether it's spirits, whether it's wine, whether it's spirits-based sort of seltzers or RTDs, there's a lot of activity from them. Um, you've seen wine companies like Gallo uh, that have either innovated internally into spirits products or they've acquired them, um, such as Germain Robin. Um, you've also got Gallo innovating things like High Noon, which has been a, a huge success right out of the gate. Um, and then you see independent companies that are innovating brands like Beatbox doing a, a wine-based product that drinks more like a beer occasion. Or you've got Ondo, which is a tequila-based sort of seltzer RTD product. Um, you got Willie's Super Brew, which is another sort of innovative seltzer kind of going in the more um, healthier, better for you ingredient space. Uh, and then you got Anheuser-Busch, of course, and all the other big beer companies that are innovating seltzers a thousand different ways because they see that's where the market's headed. Uh, another sort of emerging trend, a little more in the earlier stage for sure, but um, a lot of new innovations in cannabis and CBD beverages. And some of these are designed to taste or maybe simulate the effects of alcohol. Some are designed to do things that are completely different and give you a completely different kind of buzz. But there's a lot of interesting innovation in terms of what you can do, whether it's actual beverage form um, like Rebel Coast or like Two Roots or Recess, or it's a product like Ripple that you put into any beverage you like and you add the, the effects of, of THC or CBD to that product without actually fundamentally changing the, the beverage you're putting it in. Um, and then we're seeing a lot of innovation, of course, north of the border in the Canadian market that will eventually get down to the US. Um, still a very tiny market and a very tiny share even of cannabis, but it's an interesting development to see if these products can, can take some of the share of the occasions where people might have used alcohol um, to relax or to socialize. Um, you know, if they're trying to find ways to replace that with a cannabis or a CBD based product. Uh, another huge, huge movement, you know, for the last really five or 10 years, but it's accelerated so much during COVID is just the, the changing of route to market, um, especially through e-commerce and direct to consumer. Um, and we've seen a lot of companies innovate on their own and have to be agile and adapting to the market and try and move more product through e-commerce than they were before because of COVID and because of on-premise closures and tasting room and tap room closures. Um, but we've also seen some acquisition activity. Um, Constellations made a couple purchases in the wine space that are focused on DTC and e-commerce. Um, Campari has made an investment in an overseas e-commerce platform. Um, you know, the Wine Spirits Holsters Association themselves invested a few years ago in Drizzly. Um, you know, they see the, the future of a three-tier compliant e-commerce platform as being very intriguing. 
And then I think, you know, beyond that, we're seeing a lot of suppliers, especially small and mid-sized ones um, in a lot of different states um, that took advantage of, you know, at least temporarily, if not permanently loosened local laws around how and when you can sell alcohol, um, whether it's selling a pre-mixed cocktail to go with a meal from a restaurant, or whether it's a distillery that suddenly had a, a temporary, temporary ability to sell products to go or extra products to go to customers they weren't allowed to before. Um, you know, time will tell whether or not these new loosened regulatory schemes stay permanent. I think a lot of them will. I think some of them they're already trying to roll back. Um, but I think once the consumer gets used to these, and I think once the market sort of realizes that, you know, giving these, these restaurants and distilleries and different establishments, you know, a few more freedoms, you know, hasn't necessarily broken apart the three-tier system. I think there should be some more openness to keeping those new rules in place. Uh, geography is another big one. We're seeing a lot of convergence and blurred lines. Um, you know, obviously the world has become much more global in the past few decades, um, certainly a little less now during COVID, but I don't think that macro trend is necessarily going to change. I think people still like to experience other cultures and other products, and you've seen a lot of M&A activity um, across multiple beverage and beverage alcohol sectors covering this. You know, Topo Chico was a big move. Um, we were involved in this transaction here, so it's a little selfish to include it, but we were involved in the transaction to help sell New Belgium to Lion Kieran. You know, that was their, their biggest move to date um, in the U.S. Um, you've seen Anheuser-Busch invest in multiple brands across other countries. Patagonia is one we highlight here, but they've done a lot of investment in a lot of different continents. Um, you've seen companies like Sazerac uh, make significant investments in distilleries in India. Um, just seeing the growth that's already coming and is to come in that market. Uh, there's a lot of geographic um, convergence that's already happened. And I think if you look at the way the, the landscape of the supplier world across all beverage categories has consolidated, I think you're gonna see more and more consolidation that goes cross border. And then the second big trend we wanted to talk about today was resilience. I think you know, the, the M&A market certainly was quiet after the, the first wave of COVID really hit back in March, but we're really seeing it start to pick up in the past, I would say four to six weeks. And the biggest trends we're seeing um, beyond convergence and beyond the interest in acquirers looking at all these different categories that sort of blur lines and, and blur what a consumer thinks a product might be or could be, is we're seeing that, that acquirers are focused on, on brands and businesses that have shown resilience through COVID and really especially on brands and businesses that have thrived during COVID. And it's hard to say anyone's really thrived. There's been there's been challenges and there's been uh, unfortunate effects for, for all beverage alcohol businesses during COVID and um, you know, a terrible loss of, of not only activity, but employment in the on-premise sector. Um, but we have seen an increase in activity in, in, in companies, whether it's financial or strategic that want to invest and require uh, beverage alcohol brands that have shown a lot of resilience during this um, that have either were already well positioned for direct consumer and e-commerce or have pivoted to that. Um, ones that were more focused on off-premise retail than on, or again, have pivoted to that. Um, ones that had a delivery capability or can use the delivery capability of someone else's third party system um, have been all really important. I think in certain segments, certainly RTD cocktails, seltzers, um, canning capacity has been huge um, and in short supply for everyone. And I think, you know, companies that have internal canning capacity and more important have the ability to get cans um, across all sectors are going to be very, very important for requires and investors to get their hands around. Um, you know, I think having a, a good supply chain has been key. Certainly um, cans are involved in that, but also other, other key ingredients and raw materials, you know, in an uncertain world where you're not sure if there's going to be more COVID closures either in this country or other countries when you're suddenly not able to get the supplies you need. Um, having an efficient supply chain and having enough inventory has been really critical. Um, I think, you know, I mentioned it before, but the ability to pivot has been super important. So having really good management teams that are able to, to think on their feet and able to see a step or two ahead and understand what they might need to do to change their business model has been really key uh, for the interest we're seeing in some of our clients and some of the interest we're seeing across the industry. And then I think, you know, for, for companies that have a significant on-premise presence, whether it's um, through their own channels um, or sometimes through others, uh, but especially with the own premise, the ability to quickly track and mitigate if they have any issues with employees having positive tests and isolating that and dealing with it and, and sanitizing and making sure uh, the issue doesn't spread has been also critical. And we've had, we've had several clients and several industry friends we know that have, that have had to learn 
uh, quickly how to do this and how to create better systems for tracking and isolating. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, we all hope that I think there's going to be fewer issues and fewer closures in the future. Um, but, you know, if, if they do come back, you're going to need to have the ability to quickly shut down and quickly reopen. Good day, Emily, Ryan, and everybody out there on this digital channel. I hope all are safe and well today. Before I start, Emily and Park Street, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this event today. So today I will talk a little bit about who Distill Ventures is, what we're looking for in brands, and spend a couple of minutes at the end to talk a little bit about how we're managing through the COVID pandemic. Distill Ventures, we are the world's first accelerator dedicated to premium spirits and non-alcoholic brands. We were founded back in 2013, and we have a team of 20 plus people in Europe and in the United States. Our office in North America is in New York City, and most of the team members are spread out uh, across the US. So what do we do? The Steel Ventures backs founders to build, scale, and sell the global drinks brands of the future. How we work. Our approach to each business is unique and is developed according to the opportunities or challenges of each founder and brand. There are four major areas where we try to be helpful with our partner brands. The first one, and perhaps the most popular one, is investment, where we arrange for cash investment from the IGO. And that comes in all shapes and forms. There is no fixed amount where we invest or no fixed percentage where we're invested in. Each brand and each relationship is different and unique, and it depends on the category, the stage in the life cycle, and where the brand is capable of going. The next major area of help that we offer to our partner brands is um, expertise in partnering. The moment that we engage in a relationship with a brand, we start sharing experience and best practices and start working together in building and managing a solid growth plan for the future. We effectively become an extension of the team of each of our founder brands. And then we give founders access to our very extensive network of experts across marketing, sales, legal, financial, and pretty much everything that a founder may need in their journey to scale. And finally, we give founders access to Redwood, our sales execution team in North America. What do we look for? That is perhaps the one question I get more frequently. First, we look for the industry's best and brightest entrepreneurs with the focus, vision, and desire, passion perhaps, to lead and grow their products. What do they look like? They're resilient, they have a high work ethic, they come from all walks of life with a very diverse and unique background. They're dreamers and they're explorers. So how does this all come together? Well, once we identify the founders, it comes down to a great brand, which brings something new, unique to the market that consumers like it and have already connected to it, or we have reasonable confidence that the consumers will connect to it down the road. We're looking for brands that are scalable and we're looking for founders where they have a clear plan where funding will bring them to the next level. Founders, with all those attributes I referenced earlier, along with their teams, want to build their business. They are committed to building their business and willing to sell down the road. The businesses can be in a pre-launch phase or in an early stage phase, and they are looking for help. They are in the alcoholic drink segment, except for wine and beer, or they're in the non alcoholic segment, which is a segment that we're very excited about. So this is pretty much everything about the Steel Ventures. Uh, I will now touch a little bit on how we're all dealing with COVID-19. So COVID remains for all of us on a personal and of course, professional level, a big challenge. I am sure everybody on this session today have been impacted one way or another by COVID. And we're all hopeful that this pandemic will pass soon. What are some of the challenges that we have encountered so far? 
And I guess the question is, where do I start? So perhaps the biggest challenge that we are seeing out there is the shutdown of the on-premise. I've been working in New York City for almost 25 years now, and this is the first time I've seen New York in the shape that it is today. I read every day on how the restaurant business in New York will effectively shut down by almost 50% by the end of this year, and that the other 50% that will remain open will be materially impacted and the revenues that they had experienced in the past are not coming anytime soon. And then we look at the off-premise. And while we see great growth in Nielsen, uh, the off-premise uh, has its challenges as well. It's about self-execution. How do we talk to the buyers? How do we engage the trade? How do we get to the consumer? How do we work around all of those restrictions? Social distancing, getting in a car and driving and seeing an account. Those remain and will remain, I think, for some time, challenges that we have to work around. Of course, everybody's doing their best and are adjusting to new ways of interacting and bringing the product to the trade and consumers. And another area that is very close to our heart is the craft distilleries and how this pandemic has impacted their revenue and how dangerous it has been for many of them um, on not only losing revenue, but having to let people go and for many of them having to shut down. Our response as TV, well, early in March, when we realized how ugly COVID would be, we got closer to our founders and started working with them in finding ways to adapt to the challenges and tackle what it is that appeared to be an early sign of crisis. We revised strategy very quickly and we focused our resources on the off-premise and started thinking of different ways to connect to consumers. Digital has been a focus area for us since pre-COVID, where we have invested resources and people in getting better at connecting to consumers through that particular channel. Digital, in our opinion, will continue to be a great opportunity to engage with the consumers during COVID and definitely post-COVID. So our response really was accepting, adapting, and very quickly taking action. Um, that works so far. How are we dealing with COVID-19 and what does the future look like? We don't know, we're learning. We try to get smarter by way of looking at trends, reading our reports and adjusting quickly the strategy forward. We think the on-premise, at least for the short term, will continue to have its challenges. We think consumers will continue to adapt quickly and find ways to find brands. Talking to them through digital may be an effective approach in delivering the message and making the connection. We also think that being innovative in how we talk to consumers, in how we engage them, and what it is that we're suggesting to them is gonna be key. The at-home experience is interesting. Finding ways for consumers to have an experience with our product and finding more ways on how to do that will be key in our growth strategy forward. And of course, the future is gonna be about resilience. It's gonna be about how much are we going to learn from this experience, what strategies are going to get right, and how much are we willing to test and learn and leverage and use when this pandemic goes away. So this is it on these three ventures and our thoughts on the pandemic. I thank you and I'm ready for the questions. Okay, so my first one is, based on, on volume and how your business has changed this year. So Evans, I'm gonna start with you. Have you talked to more or less brands interested in an investment in 2020? Are we really slowing down? Uh, I think the answer is no. Uh, I think there is a tremendous interest across to find those founders who are putting together the brands that consumers will need in the future. I heard yesterday that there is a wholesale house here in New York that has launched 20 new brands in New York since COVID. What does that mean? Uh, it means that founders out there remain resilient, find ways to bring their vision to life, and they come to markets with the new tools that the COVID limitations uh, mandate. So to us, we remain excited, we remain interested, we haven't necessarily seen a slowdown in founders creating 
And um, we will just work around the COVID challenges and continue to engage. Okay, Ryan, same question for you, but from your different perspective, have you seen more interest in you know, mergers and partnerships or less? Yeah, so it's been sort of an interesting year. Um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. I would say if you had asked me in February, um, Arlington probably had probably our best pipeline ever. Um, and we do a lot of work in restaurants as well as beverage and other franchise businesses. So as you would imagine, the restaurant piece of that slowed down drastically and still remains pretty slow. Although we do have some restaurant deals that are getting reactivated um, for the ones that are you know more either digitally focused or delivery focused off premise to go. Um, but yeah, so we had an incredible pipeline. Suddenly that pipeline went very much, not fully on pause, but pretty close. Um, and I would say we had a bunch of, of uh, beverage companies reach out to us late March, early April, mid April, um, some amazing brands that we had known for years. And, you know, some of these founders were not panicking, but they were sort of reconsidering how they looked at the world. And a lot of these, you know, we had several of these that we had known and amazing brands, amazing people. And we were friends with them, never expected them to think about wanting to sell. And most of them didn't. They thought they'd be independent forever. And suddenly they found themselves going, maybe I should look at getting a partner <laughs> um, now. Maybe maybe the world's not as certain as I thought it was. And some of those um, we've taken on as clients um, and we've been fortunate to have them. And some of them, things ended up settling out a little more than they thought. And they feel like now they can still weather the storm alone. Um, so we had an interesting pickup, I would say in the early COVID pandemic. Um, and then things got a little quiet over the summer. We had a bunch of, of deals we were still sort of had in the background waiting to find the right time to launch for, you know, some great brands that are very well positioned to do well during this and have done well. Um, but we were trying to wait for the right time when the market was sort of ready. And uh, I would say since Labor Day, especially, but really in the past probably six weeks, um, we've seen an incredible uptick in the amount of investors that are now looking at things more on the financial side than strategic, but it's certainly both. Um, but I think, you know, the world is certainly not certain or predictable by any stretch yet. But I do think as time goes on, everyone sort of feel like, okay, if it was really uncertain in, in April, it's still pretty uncertain, but I'd have a better idea of, of what's happening and what might happen. And if things do close down again, I know how the world's going to sort of react. Um, so we're seeing a, a pretty incredible level of interest from some of the investor pool and looking at, at brands that have really thrived during this. So it's been a very, a very strange up and down year, but we've been we're fortunate to have a lot of great clients that just have amazing brands, um, you know, great management teams that have been able to shift priorities during this into channels that that worked, um, you know, out of channels that were really hurting them for a moment. Sure. Okay. So you mentioned brands that were like initially they were not necessarily panicking, but they, um, you know, thought about taking on investments when they maybe hadn't thought about that before. So my question, follow up question to both of you is. Are you recommending that people don't jump the gun just yet if they are doing that, you know, thinking about an investment because this year is scary and unpredictable? Yeah, I would say you don't want to do this in a, in a quick sort of ill-advised, unthoughtful way. That can be just devastating and you're likely probably to not get a deal or get a deal you don't want. I mean, I think, you know, if you've got a brand that can attract an investment in this market, it means you've done something pretty special and you want to go to market the right way. Um, and that might mean in certain occasions, it might mean you go to market fairly quickly because there's a, a reason to do so. But in a lot of cases, it probably still means you go to market very thoughtfully. You don't broadcast it to the entire world that you're trying to find an investor. I and mean, you still want to be very selective if you're a brand owner about who you talk to and why. Um, because you know, going out to everyone looks like you're panicking and it's not likely to get the, the response you want. Hi, yeah. Ryan comments. I, I think any attempt to bring in investors has to be done in a manner that is very intelligent uh, and nothing should ever be done in a panic mode. Um, I think there are many opportunities for many brands, especially the ones who are realizing growth now. And I see a few of those where the, the growth is demanding for resources to come in uh, and, and that puts them in a position to be competitive to an extent in getting the right investors uh, to come in and invest with them. The ones who are seeking investment to survive uh, and live through COVID may get some resistance from investors. Uh, and there are certain proof points that some investors are going to be looking for during and of course after COVID. So I don't think there is one right answer for each and every instance. Uh, and, and I guess the recommendation would be do your homework. Um, understand exactly where you wanna be, who you wanna partner with and what is it that you're willing to give away. 
Sure. And I would add one more thing to that too. I think one thing we're seeing from investors is that, you know, obviously there's going to be some, some horrible consequences of this pandemic in terms of not just personal lives, but also businesses that will go under as Evis talked about in this presentation. I think, you know, the investors that are excited to invest in this space understand that there's going to be a culling and there was going to be a culling in some of these spaces, no matter what, it was just probably a few years away, but they understand that the ones that do survive this and are well positioned, whether it's via their brand positioning route to market, how much capital they have behind them are really going to really going to succeed in the next few years. Um, so the investors are really excited about the ones they feel like will be the, the survivors and the thrivers after all of this is done. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think in the craft beer space, uh, a few years ago, we started to see smaller brands sort of, you know, merging or, or banding together to build out a larger portfolio, which we haven't really seen as much in the spirit space. Um, is that a viable strategy? And do you expect we'll see more of those? You know, it was, there's mixed results. Um, I think I think sometimes there was occasions where the geographies were complementary enough and the portfolios are complementary enough where it did work and it had some benefits. Mm -hmm. I do think a lot of those small brands that got together didn't quite realize all of the synergies and cost savings they thought they would see. I think that, you know, unfortunately, you know, you put two or three small companies together, you're still not going to get the procurement synergies you would of one large company. Um, and I think even more than that, I think it's really hard to find a, a culture and personality mesh both at the executive level and also down through the employees. Um, you know, often these small companies are built around the founder's personality, um, which has usually had to be strong to get to where they are. And trying to put, you know, two or three of these together with all strong personalities, usually just the culture alone is a challenge. Some of them did pretty well, um, but some of them found out the hard way that it wasn't, you know, two plus two didn't equal five, and maybe two plus two equal three. Sure, okay. Um, and point of clarification on both of your companies. Um, do you only in, invest and or sell brands or do you also work with you know assets? Were they to be separated? On our side, we don't necess we invest in brands. Mm -hmm. uh, we invest in founders, I should say first, and we invest in their vision and how that is structured uh, to an extent the first with each and every investment. But what it is that we're looking to uh, be relevant is seeing the brands uh, and the people. Yeah, we're generally brands as well. I mean, there may be a very rare occasion we look at doing some sort of an asset transaction if it just makes perfect sense for us for whatever reason, but we're branded too. I mean, our, our, our company was founded by people who know brands and, and have operated brands, and we're very focused on the branded space, well, no matter what segment we're in, whether it's beverage or restaurant or franchise, it all has to have a branded piece to it for us to make sense in general. Okay. All right. So then I kind of want to move into the next stage um, of my questions and talk about sort of what, what impresses you in a brand. Um, and I know you both, uh, or at least Evis, I know you talked about this a little bit, but I want to uh, ask a couple of follow-up. So are there certain points in, you know, a, a company's lifespan that you would like to get them to before they consider taking on investments from a strategic or a larger partner? Every brand is different. And every potential relationship presents to us a, a different and unique way to evaluate each and every time. Mm -hmm. What it is that we're learning is that the founders are so unique and they're so special. And these are um, the attributes that we are effectively looking for. You know, certainly the team, who is leading a great brand that brings something new to the market that consumers like now or would like down the road, knowing that the brands can be scalable, they have the capabilities, knowing that the brands have a clear plan on how they get to the next level. These are the things that we check off every time that we engage with brands. Um, are we interested in the brands having sales? Not necessarily. Um, we have invested in the past in pre launch and we have great success in those areas just because we checked the right boxes and we were able to assess the attributes of the founders and their vision. Um, what about the brands that they already have for you? That's interesting, but it's not necessarily the, the primary deciding factor. If they have sales, what does that mean? Is it only volume? Not really. It's really the health 
of the product? How are they connecting to the consumers? Um, where are their consumers? Where could they go using what it is that they have already learned? So, and then at the end of the day, um, when we look at brands and we are checking off all those boxes, I, I, I think a deciding factor for us is also the, the fact as to whether we can help them or not. And whether the brand really needs TV uh, and whether we are going to be able to have the chemistry, uh, the right relationship with the founders to join their journey and help them um, grow. Uh, Ryan, are you, uh, is Arlington primarily work just transactions or do you do any incubation? No, I mean, we're, we're just mostly transactional advisory. We don't, we don't do any direct investing. Um, we, we do some consulting in certain cases, um, but really more strategic consulting, but it's really us advising people, whether it's the buyer or the seller. We're usually on the sell side, but it's us advising and representing someone in the transaction is what we do. And I would say to piggyback on um, the things we look for in brands, I mean, it's, it's, I'll steal from Evis because his slides are good and because <laughs> our job is to, is to, to partner up uh, acquirers and brands. So we're looking for what the acquirers are looking for because um, that's how we can best do our job to, to find the brands that are going to be attractive to people like Evis. Um, and again, consumer connection is the, the critical piece. Okay. So you, so you do at least um, vet them. It sounds like, you know, you, you pick the oh, ones yeah. you think are going to sell. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a small team. We're a super specialized shop. And so, you know, we only do so many deals a year just given how much time each person has in the day. Um, so we have to be super selective of who we take on, you know, because every every transaction for us probably takes us between four to 12 months to get done. Um, so it's a significant time commitment. It's a lot of energy spent. So we have to make sure that, you know, if we take on a client, we really feel like we have a high chance of getting them a successful deal for them and for us. Okay. And Ryan, are different business models more valuable now? So like a company that was already good at e-commerce, right? It, is that a medium term change or do you think that's long term? I feel like some of those things are long term. I think, feel like some of those things were inevitable. They've just gotten accelerated by, by years probably mm -hmm. during this time. Um, you know, I think there was there was already a growing focus on things like e-commerce and, and things like, you know, categories that were sort of hard to define. You know, a seltzer, it's taxed like a beer. Most of them are, but they're not really brewed like a beer. Um, you know, I think there was already this trend towards things like that and e-commerce and different ways of going to market. And I think there was already a trend towards brands that do well in off-premise chains. And all of that has only increased. And, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful, like everyone is, that the on-premise comes back strong but I think that most acquirers and investors now would rather hedge their bets that if it doesn't, you have a brand that, you know, if it already didn't have a strong e-commerce presence and off-premise presence before this, that they've shifted to that now. And they're well positioned that if the on-premise does have some, some stops and starts in the future, that you've got a brand that can survive without that or, or without a significant portion of that. I think it's a long-term trend probably. Okay. And on my side, I think what it is that we're paying attention to is the skills that the teams are developing during this moment of crisis. Mm -hmm. And what it is that we are really appreciating is how resilience, how the work ethic, how the passion and desire to not only survive, but to grow uh, with most of the teams that we have um, in relationships with, uh, it, it is by far the, the greatest attribute the team is going to walk away um, when COVID is done. And I think the strategy of surviving in crisis is going to take its own definition and its own chapter in how to grow a brand. Um, quite a bit uh, of the strategies in play today are going to eventually become long-term uh, for many of the brands. We talked about digital. We talked about home occasions. We talk about a new way to approach the on-premise, different ways that we're getting relevant or becoming relevant to the off-premise. So this is effectively a testing period for most of the brands out there where everything that they're learning uh, will become extremely valuable to all of us, to somebody like Ryan and definitely to somebody like Distant Ventures. Sure, okay. I agree with that, especially from, you know, even our own perspective. <laughs> we're, we're experimenting and testing and changing and figuring out what works in the future. So I think that's probably true for everyone. Um, okay, so I want to know 
how important of a role does geography play um, in a you know craft distiller when when you're evaluating them? Is it just you know one of many factors, or is it more important than some of the others? Geography alone should not really that much uh, impact the decision. Uh, geography is definitely a complement to a brand's offering, along with everything else that we talked about earlier, people, category, liquid quality, price, environment, et cetera. Um, at Distill Ventures, we are definitely very excited to see new and unique offerings from all over the world. Um, we're not restricting our vision to North America or to Europe alone. We are very excited to see the growth of the new world whiskies. Uh, not only excited, uh, but also invested in the new world whiskey category. And one of our brands uh, out of Australia uh, is doing incredibly well. Mm -hmm. And it's about the founder, their vision, incredible quality and incredible value. So um, there are amazing brands coming from unique and perhaps uncommon places. And we're looking for those. And therefore, Geography shouldn't limit our vision, uh, but rather it should complement what it is that we uh, we want to bring to the U.S. consumer. Okay, so then I have a little bit of a flip side question to that. Um, do you think that the way that the U.S. market has handled COVID and that it's a you know a, a bit chaotic? Do you think people are reconsidering entering the U.S. market at this point until we get a little further down the road? Um, Great question. And I think it depends uh, on whom you ask. If you're asking wineries from Europe and how tariffs are impacting them, uh, you may get a different answer from an ambitious founder coming from the Southeast Asia or from Australia or from somewhere in Europe. So I don't think there is one answer that can uh, properly address what is happening right now. I think there is opportunity for many brands, depending on whom it is that they want to talk to um, in the consumer base, uh, there is opportunity for imports uh, to be successful in the US. Uh, we see the American consumer changing behaviors and habits rapidly. They've been adjusting to COVID quickly. Um, we were not surprised when we saw the, the explosion of e-commerce. We are not surprised to see consumers finding comfort in purchasing their uh, alcoholic beverages um, in grocery. So quite a bit of what is happening now is telling us that consumers are willing to explore, willing to change behaviors, willing to learn. Uh, and within that new behavior, I think there is space for um, new world uh, to uh, be relevant to the American consumer, even in this environment. No, I totally agree. I mean, you know, it's it, tariffs are, you've got external factors like tariffs that makes things tough, but the U.S. is the largest profit pool in the world. You know, every brand would love to get here if they could and if they could do it prof profitably. So Evis is right. It depends on the founder and the brand and what their strategy is and positioning. But the U.S. consumer, you know, has so much money to spend and is so interested in trying new things from new places, especially, like you said, in the world of whiskey. Like there's so many interesting things you can do with whiskey, especially because of the aging and the provenance and how different climates and, and different geographies affect that. Like in the US consumer wants to try all of those things and find out what's new. I mean, if you would, you know, 10 years ago, if you had 20 years, if you had told someone that 10 years ago, Taiwanese whiskey would be, would be taking over the world. Like no one would have thought you were, <laughs> thought you were right. Um, but you know, the US consumer wants to try new things and things their friends haven't tried before. And they want to be the person to introduce that to their, to their peer group. Sure. Okay. So we've talked about a lot of different um, newer and up and coming channels, but we haven't really discussed social media very much. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the role that social media will play in the future for, for growing a brand? I mean, I think it's, I think it's big. I mean, I think if you do it the right way, it's big. I think it's easy to do it in a way that feels very authentic, like you're selling to someone. And I think consumers, especially younger ones, see right through that and it turns them off. Um, but I think if you do it the right way, it can be very successful. Um, I mean, this isn't a, a beer, a, a spirits example, but, uh, I sold a craft brewery, uh, St. Archer to Miller Coors a few years ago. They built their entire brand on Instagram. Uh, this is before Instagram was the popular vehicle for doing that. Um, but they were sort of ahead of the curve. They saw that at that point, Facebook had become uncool. It was for the old people and Instagram was the next thing. And you can do a lot visually and their brand was very visual. So I think if you find brands like that, that, 
they understand which channel makes sense for their brand and how they speak to consumers and how consumers speak back to them. You can do a lot of interesting things, you know, fair, fairly cost efficiently. Okay, Evis, what do you think? <laughs> Absolutely, with Ryan. I, I, I think the social media and digital has, it's not really new. It, it's been around for a long time. I think it's a lot more important now just because consumers are finding comfort to communicate and interact through this channel. I think when it's done right, uh, it, it can produce incredible results uh, and the cost uh, may not be as high as traditional methods uh, in marketing. Um, I think there are many interesting brands out there and we've seen a few transactions of those where they were able to engage consumers, create a tribe, get close and connect to them strictly through social. We also know that social is a place where the younger consumer finds comfort in interacting with. Uh, and how the younger consumer is thinking today is perhaps very different from, from what it was 15, 20 years ago. The amount of influence that social applies to them, the amount of influence that their peers are applying to them makes it perhaps attractive for brands to think seriously on how good they should be in this particular channel. Okay, all right, now I have two questions left that are a little bit more big picture questions. Um, so the first one is, Ryan, I kind of wanted to hear a little bit more about cannabis um, because we haven't talked about that a lot, especially um, you know, in, in the beverage space. So I was curious, how has 2020 been, you know, how has that space been affected by COVID? Yeah, it's done surprisingly well. Um, I, they were the benefit, certainly, of in the early days of COVID. There was a lot of question about whether they'd be deemed essential businesses. And in most states, they were. Um, so they were fortunate that that broke their way. And I'm sure they lobbied hard to get it. Um, but they've had a good year. I think, you know, people that were already consuming cannabis certainly haven't changed their habits. Um, and <laughs> everyone's working from home, so probably have more chances to consume, um, even though they probably shouldn't have been. So they've done surprisingly well. I think. The canvas beverage space, like I mentioned, is still very small, but there's a lot of interesting things there to me happening. Um, just some of the recent advancements in, in the sort of infusion and emulsion technology, yeah. the way they can dial in some of these beverages to pinpoint, accurately mimic the, the results of drinking a spirit or a beer or a wine. The way the buzz hits you, the way it dissipates, it's remarkable what they can do. And I think as the technology continues to evolve there, there'll be a way they'll be able to find ways to to change the, the onset of the buzz and the offset so that it is completely different from alcohol. Where they could do, yeah. they could do a product potentially where you have the, the, the buzz hit you in 15 minutes like, like Spirits does, but it may last for two hours without going up or down. There's different things they can do there that are really interesting with the, the chemistry and the biology. Um, so I think long-term it's a really interesting space. There's a lot of challenges, especially around THC and the fact that you can't ship product across state lines without breaking federal law. So there's some natural sort of diseconomies of scale. Um, but in, from the consumer standpoint, as the consumer continues to get more curious about it and open to it, it's an interesting space for sure. Okay, my last question is, we have not had a big spirits merger in several years. I think the last one that I can think of um, is, you know, Beam Suntory, right? Um, do we expect that coming out of COVID, it, it might be more likely that we would see another one <laughs> it's always hard to say. I mean, yeah. so much consolidation has already happened. I mean, and certainly there's probably still a few candidates that seem sort of ripe for it. Um, you know, I think during COVID, everyone sort of buckled down and focused on fixing their own business and making sure they're prepared to weather the storm. But I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if coming out of this, you know, companies, you know, if some companies are feeling more confident about the future or a better position than others, you know, it could be a good time for them to take a run at someone they feel like has got some really interesting brands and maybe not the right strategy. Um, so yeah, I think you could see some interesting activity there. I think coming out of COVID, you're gonna see a lot of interesting activity from M&A that was either put on the shelf for a few months or for again, for brands that suddenly became stronger or weaker during the process, but still have an attractive, attractive brand asset to sell. Sure. Okay. Well, is there any important aspect of, you know, mergers and partnerships um, that you, that I didn't get to that you guys want to mention or are you good on your end as well? I think we're good. I mean, I think like I said, it's all about, you know, finding those brands that really connect to consumer. Um, I mean, the one thing I've been really surprised and impressed with some of our clients is not only the ones that are well positioned in the right channels, you know, post COVID, mm -hmm. but we've had clients where their customers are finding them. 
like they're already in some good channels for off-premise volume and things like that and direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. But we've had, you know, it's a sign of an amazing brand when, when your customer not only is, is, is buying your product, but they're seeking out your product because they couldn't find it in places they used to. I think that's an amazing sign yeah. for some of these brands and the connection they've built. Very well said. And, and, and on my side, uh, the US consumer continues to explore and they will continue to explore and they want brands that they can connect to, they can appreciate and they can stay with them at least for, for a long period of time. And the other element that we're learning about the US consumer is that they're becoming a lot more intelligent and they know what they like, uh, they see value, they appreciate value, they appreciate the story, they appreciate all the attributes a brand brings to them. Competition is fierce. There is a lot of brands out there. So when we look at founders and we look at brands, uh, we work very hard in understanding what is it that the founder is trying to do? Who is it that they're trying to connect with? Where do they want to go? How do they get there? What are their capabilities and what are their weaknesses? Where are the opportunities? And what is it that they're going to make help? Um, growing a brand is not easy. And while we read regularly about all the success stories, uh, there is a whole bunch of brands out there that they're doing it the old fashioned way, which is a lot of sugar, there are a lot of hard work and a lot of resilience in speaking to people, understanding their consumer, understanding their capabilities, and being able to put a package in front of an investor or the consumer or a buyer or the wholesale trade uh, and be able to convince them that their brand is going to offer that value that everybody has learned um, to not only appreciate, but demand. So um, it's fun, it's exciting out there to all the visionaries, to all the dreamers, continue. Continue because there is space for you down the road, absolutely. No, on our side, it's easy for us to say, visit the Distill Ventures website, and we have a very elaborate method on getting people to learn, understand, use tools, and get in touch with us. Um, happy to invite anybody out there to reach out. Uh, LinkedIn typically is a, the one method that people reach out. So whatever you think is more appropriate than me. Absolutely. And ArlingtonCapitalAdvisors.com is the website. You can find our email addresses on there. Like LinkedIn works too, just like I've said. But yeah, feel free to reach out anytime. Okay, thanks for watching everyone. We have several more videos available that are airing during Global Bar Week. Or you can check out our entire collection at parkstreetuniversity.com.